Welcome to Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. In the next half hour, you'll obtain insights and tools to transform your life using the biblical principles found in the 12-step program. We believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience because we all have struggles in life. Struggles with addictions, food, depression, anxiety, and relationships to name a few. You'll be encouraged to see how others have found a new way of life with hope for the future through life recovery. Your host is Steve Arterburn, founder of New Life Ministries and Women of Faith, author of over 100 books, and teaching pastor at Northview Church in Carmel, Indiana, one of the 20 largest churches in America. Steve is the co-editor of the Life Recovery Bible, the number one selling recovery Bible. With over 3 million copies sold, this is the Bible given to inmates by Prison Fellowship and the Pew Bible for the Salvation Army. Now here's Steve. Hi there. Steve Arterburn here, and thanks for joining me for Life Recovery Today. You know, not everybody that needs recovery is an addict. But I've got something that would help anybody. It is the one-year Life Recovery Prayer Devotional. And it's daily encouragement. Nick Harrison and I put this together, and Nick's just an amazing writer. If you've never seen this, it's just it's the newest of all of our resources for life recovery. I hope you'll think about this. Pick it up. Call 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Great to have something to take you through the whole year. Well, on today's program, I'm going to share with you some material about codependency. Now, it's a familiar term, yet really many of us don't recognize it in our very own relationships. Easy to spot it out there. And a lot of times we see it when it's so simple and obvious, but there are so many other ways that it can crop up that are a bit more subtle. In codependency, it seems like we have this need to over-involve ourselves in others' lives or believing that we're the answer. could be that it's almost like we're trying to save them to save ourselves sometimes. Or we're trying to fix them because we couldn't fix someone else, like a dad or a mom. Well, what does a codependent have in common with God? They both have a plan for your life. Well, just kidding about that. But actually, it is true. They believe trying harder is going to turn the other person around when the codependent needs to turn around and focus just on my side of the street. Now. It really can be confusing because you're really trying to be helpful, but you don't have a boundary for that help. And here's the bad news. Sometimes when you're trying to help, you want somebody else to feel better, but not really. You're doing some things that are quite damaging that make you feel better. So if you're in a relationship with somebody who struggles with addiction of any type, well, you're susceptible to codependency. And I'll try to explain that a little further in this particular video where clarity is so, uh, so important. And to me, uh, sometimes the only way we get to clarity is that we have to define confusion and where it lands. But let me tell you something. There are folks that are controlling, they're angry, uh, they're disappointed, and they've never found what they want the other person to find, and that's surrender. They're waiting for somebody with another problem to surrender. In the meantime, they're trying to change them or cure them or control them. When if they would surrender, if they would give up that role, it's amazing the impact it has on the person they have been, quote unquote, trying to help. Codependents who recover, kind of lead other people into recovery also. It can be a great thing. So, here I am, giving a listen or a watch to codependency and not being codependent anymore. We're going to be talking about codependency and people-pleasing. Now, a lot of different angles on this, a lot of different approaches on this. I'm just going to give you one, and it doesn't mean that somebody else's approach is wrong. This is just this one. Many years ago, I wrote a book called Addicted to Love. And that book addressed three things. Romance, 
addiction. This is the person that draws people in. They love the, the game, all the feelings, the attraction, being fascinated, and then they break off the relationship one after another. And then we talk about sexual addiction. And of course, we know what that is. That's where it's just all about sex and nothing else. And it drives everything. The third addiction that I talked about was relationship addiction. Some people would term um, codependency as relationship addiction. I don't. I think relationship addiction is dependency. It's, it's kind of like I am dependent, totally dependent on another person, not the other person with a problem or whatever. I just don't think I can get by without another person. And so I do anything I can to be in relationship with some of the worst characters ever, ever. Okay, so that's relationship addiction. Relationship, relationship to relationship. And I don't care what their problem is. I'll just latch on to it. You could say that's kind of codependent, but I say it's maybe kind of, but not it. Codependency is, is this, the, the classical codependency is when we are with another person and they have a problem and we get entangled in that problem. We do not have that problem, but the problem gives us a problem because we think erroneously that if we could exert more control, their problem would stop. More love. Maybe that's it. More love. Or like in sexual addiction, maybe I need to be more attractive. Maybe I need to be more available. That would be it. And so we come alongside their problem, and that's the co-part. You could say, I'm not just dependent on something. I am a co-dependent on this other thing over here. And there's another thing over here beyond the relationship. Now, let's just get the bad news out of the way. If you're codependent, you might have gotten confused and thought that you were being a good Christian. Because codependent look like they're providing care, help, mercy, all that stuff. But it's different. A Christian cares for somebody and there's no ulterior motive. There's nothing below the surface. It's just love and care. But, well, my good friend Dave Stoop, uh, he had a son. He was a heroin addict, kept on using until one day Dave made a realization that what he was doing for his son, he wasn't doing for his son. He was doing it for himself. He didn't call the police because he didn't want to look good or he didn't want to go through that. And then one day, there's a stereo missing. Dave calls the police. Policeman says to Dave, is there any idea who might have done this? And Dave said, yeah, I know who did it. It was my son who's a heroin addict. Policeman folds up his little booklet. Dave said, no, no, no. Get it right back out. I'm going to press charges. And that was the beginning of his son knowing he was serious about it and his son realizing there's something different about dad. Well, David just simply realized that he had been doing this stuff, not like they say, doing all the wrong things for the right reason. He realized he was doing the wrong stuff for the wrong reason. Boy, that takes some insight. Because we get in this rut. We, um, you know, when a person has this other thing over here, we're, uh, we're really struggling. Because we want to be more important than that thing. But if it's some kind of addiction, then it's going to be hard for us to have a power in that person's life that's greater than the power of addiction. And over and over, when we see this person going to that thing that caused the addiction, then we develop low self-esteem because, well, why aren't they coming to me? Why aren't I important enough, strong enough? Well, look, you are not powerful enough to predict this. You're not powerful enough to prevent this. And you're not powerful enough to be the program that's going to change it. That's going to have to come outside of yourself. So what happens with a codependent person is they just feel natural. When somebody around them is broken 
are involved in something really sick. They just think, well, this is the way life is. And that could be because, of course, they were raised by somebody who had a big problem. And they watched mom or dad be codependent. And they say, I'll never be like the one with the big problem. And then they turn out to be just like mom or dad. End up marrying maybe someone very similar to the person that had the problem in the family. Now, there are some ways that we can overcome codependency. Plenty of ways. There are, there are people uh, that have established organizations to fight codependency. Uh, Al-Anon, you know, Bill W.'s wife Lois started Al-Anon so that the spouses or friends, family, who had become codependent on that addiction or whatever it was, they would have a place to go and they could heal. So next time we're together, I want to talk about uh, the kinds, the different types of codependency that, that there are and some of the symptoms that we could see, the signs of it, so that we know we truly are or are not codependent. Co could stand for a lot of things, but I think the co uh, in codependent stands for cooper cooperating in the dependency. I think it's not just being a cohort over here in the problem, but I really believe we're cooperating with the addiction to keep things worse. We don't think we're making them worse, but they're getting worse. When we look at our strategy and the results, we might want to stop and say, hmm, maybe after all this time, I could assume that this particular strategy is not working. Boy, that's a great place to come to when you finally realize what you're doing hasn't produced the result that you wanted. Now, if you need some help with this, well, Take Your Life Back is probably the best book, current book on codependency because it's about taking your life back. One of the things in that book says that a person who has taken their life back is the decider of their own lives. Are you going through your struggles alone? Do you want someone to talk to to help you through your pain? Do you feel like a failure when you relapse again, telling yourself, next time will be different? Don't walk this path alone anymore. Join a life recovery group today and be a person that your friends and family can be proud of. God created us to be in community and we believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience. There are life recovery groups all over the country and if there isn't one in your area, we can help you start one. Life Recovery brings recovery to you, right where you are. You'll take a journey with others to find healing and freedom. Whether you're looking to join a group or start one, New Life Ministries is here for you. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE or visit liferecoverytoday.net. It's hard to find a trusted friend when you're in crisis. Someone who's been there and understands but who also has the training and skill to give you practical help. Family, friends, and churches want to help, but often they're not equipped to care for those dealing with problems like addiction and pornography, infidelity, anger, or depression. New Life Ministries is here to provide help and hope in life's hardest places. We're not focused on making people feel better, we're focused on helping people do the work that will help them be better. At New Life, we have resources available to help you, like books, DVDs, CDs, workshops, and our network of licensed counselors. If you need help, call 1-800-NEW-LIFE and begin your new life today. Welcome back. Well, did you identify any characteristics of codependency in your life or in your relationships? In this segment, I'm going to talk about the signs of codependency. Why does a codependent buy two copies of self-help books, one to read, one to pass along to somebody else? Well, that's just what we do. Let's go deeper into understanding codependency than just looking on the surface. I think, I hope you're going to gain something from this piece on codependency from inside out. 
What does the co-stand for? Well, I've said it stands for you're cooperating with the dependency or the dependent. But um, I also think co might stand for confusion because it's very confusing when you're codependent. Because sometimes, you know, there are two different roles you could play. You could be a caregiver, but also a codependent caregiver. You know, if you have a child that has an addiction problem and they're 14 and living in your home, you're the caregiver. But you can also be the one that destroys that child because you're being codependent with them. You're enabling, or maybe even you're perpetrating the problem rather than doing something to make it better. How do we know if what we're doing is codependent or it's just taking care of business? It's caring for and providing what a person needs. Well, when somebody uh, is codependent, um, it, they start to feel like they really can't live without this person. And so uh, we've heard of people making a, a kind of a line in the sand and saying either you do this or I'm going to leave. An ultimatum, do this or this is going to happen. But they're so codependent that they would never do that. One of my first experiences with this was in the little hospital that turned into an alcohol and drug treatment center in Fort Worth, Texas, when I was going to seminary. We converted the psych hospital into an alcohol and drug treatment center, and one of the patients that came in in those early days was an alcoholic who had been drinking for 40 years. And in Texas, uh, you didn't deal much at that time with prescription drug abuse or hard drug. It was mostly beer drinking guys that got in trouble. This woman had prayed. She had hoped. She had wished all her life that he would get well. He finally got sick enough that he had to be admitted to a treatment center. Couldn't function anymore. So he stayed with us. She went home and she died that night. I always thought, is it a coincidence or was mission accomplished? Her whole life had revolved around this guy. She would have never thought of leaving him. And so he was the center of attention for her life. That's one of those signs. Why do we have that? Why do we have that attention to someone else and not us? Maybe we are afraid of being abandoned. Maybe we were left at one point. Maybe someone betrayed us or abandoned us physically. And so we just simply cannot imagine leaving another person or saying something that would cause them to leave us because we're so afraid of being abandoned. Now, there's another uh, sign of codependency. You, to be codependent, you, you can't have anybody supporting you because if you have somebody that's really supporting you, they're going to say to you, hey, what are you doing? That's, that's not good. That's not healthy. That's not helping anybody. So if you're out there on your own with no support system, that's a sign of being codependent, especially when you've got that person uh, causing problems, producing consequences that have to be dealt with on a regular basis. So without that uh, support system that's saying, here, do this, do that, or this is what we see, then you're going to get in trouble and uh, stay in trouble. The other thing is, uh, there's kind of a, a sense of enmeshment with the other person. It's like we become them almost. And we see life through their eyes or feel it through their emotions. And we kind of lose ourselves. Uh, and sometimes it's not kind of lose ourselves. We totally lose ourselves. And if you've lost yourself, you're probably not going to be secure in the things that you think and believe. And so there's a lot of self-doubt that's there. A lot of questioning what I do. Insecurity. And so here's where the people-pleasing comes in. If I doubt myself and I'm a pleasing person and codependent, I'm going to do whatever I can to make you feel better. That's going to make me feel better. And pleasing doesn't please. It uh, minimizes, it delays, it distracts. Nothing good in pleasing. And then finally, I would just say this, a codependent person is just full of resentment. Oh, you know, you don't say it out loud. That'd be tacky. <laughs> but it's there. 
and you're kind of seething inside. You mumble to yourself. You've got this internal dialogue that's going all the time. And you resent the heck out of a lot of things. Probably the person you resent the most is yourself. How did I get myself into this? Well, I don't know how you got into it, but I know there's a way out. And so we're going to talk about how do we deal with or get out of or resolve some of these codependent relationships that we get in, and we'll do that next time. More insight on all of this you could get from the book, Take Your Life Back, and I hope you will. Hello again. Codependency is so powerful, and there are some elements of it in every relationship. The challenge to recovery from codependency is recognizing it in your life, and, well, has your life become unmanageable, as unmanageable the person you're trying to change? Good news. There's hope for recovery from codependency. I'm going to explain what treatment looks like in this next segment. Many people say, I've tried everything, but not really. Maybe there's something you've never tried. Don't you love being around people pleasers? Uh, they please you. <laughs> they do everything they can to make it better for you. But you know what's not so great about it? You lose respect for people pleasers because they're really stuck in this role of just trying to make things better or keep the peace, whatever it is, and you don't respect them. They kind of cease to exist as a real, live, full human being. So if you're a people pleaser and you think that pleasing is going to uh, get you somewhere in the relationship, it is absolutely not going to. Uh, you're going to be very, very disappointed uh, in the results when you finally decide I'm no longer going to be a pleaser. Okay, so people pleasing is one thing. Codependency is another. What do I need to do if I am a codependent? Well, for all the addictions, there are codependency groups. Al-Anon is for uh, alcohol, alcoholics, if you're married to one, or dating somebody, or your parents were. Sex-Anon, I mean, there's a, an anonymous group for codependency for people that are in relationship with sex addicts. So what I would do, if I realized I was a codependent, I would go on a computer or my phone and I would Google codependency groups. And I would see what the churches have. There's some codependent life recovery groups. See what the church has. I'd see what the community has. But one of the things I have to do to get out of codependency is get into groups and go to meetings. My friend Dave Stoop ended up with a psychologist in a, in a program helping parents deal with their kids. And one of the uh, requirements was that you would go to an al meeting every day for 30 days or you got kicked out of the group because she wanted people to get used to going to a codependency group and, and to talk with other people and hear what they had done and the struggles they've been through that might give them some insight onto how no longer to need to be codependent. Now, the other thing, in addition to that kind of group, you may need a clinician that will help you discover that it was this abuse you had as a child, this neglect, are this feeling inferior to your brothers and sisters that have led you to this place of codependency. And so a, a real life Christian counselor can help you resolve those things that maybe have never ever been addressed in your life. You just were told, oh, forgive that and move on. But that was really bad advice, superficial uh, suggestion. Now, another thing, uh, what we need if we're codependent is we need to be in healthy relationships. And sometimes we have to, as they say, change playmates and playgrounds, what we're doing. And we may have to say goodbye to some people that are really unhealthy for us. Next thing we want to do, if we want to get this um, taken care of, is we need to ask, do I need to be needed all the time? If you have a need to be needed, that, that's probably not healthy. Versus if you're inspired to meet some specific need that comes up, that's totally different. One is a coping skill. The other is using a gift from God to reach out to other people. Now, finally, if you really want help, it would be important for you to recognize that maybe I was abused, maybe I was neglected, harmed, and start to grieve the loss that may have led 
to this style of codependency and people pleasing. So if I was abused and talking to a therapist and all this stuff, going to group, it would also be great to get a book to take you through the grieving process. I grieve what will never be again. It's gone. I accept what I have today. I embrace it. Now I'm ready to look forward to the future. That's a gift to myself if I'll do it. Well, I hope something that you've heard today about codependency is going to be helpful as you continue your own recovery, whether it's you who needs it or somebody else. You can always ask people to tune in here and you can pick this video and hopefully they'll gain something from it. But someone is codependent in your life. And if it's you, rather than trying to take control of somebody else, are you taking control of your own life? How about a little surrender and some healing? You know, there are a lot of codependency jokes. One of my favorite is, what do you call a codependent who says no and doesn't feel guilty about it? Well, you call that person healthy. And that's, that's what I'm hoping for you, is to be healthy. But not only that, you know, as it says in the long version of the serenity prayer, reasonably happy in this life and then forever happy, happy in the next one. So that's what we're going for here. And if you have done all the work, all the steps, and nothing ever seems to be working, we have some things that you can do. We have, uh, through New Life, emotional freedom workshops where people are struggling in this one area and it enriches that recovery process. One of the things that both the codependent and the person with another problem uh, often fails to do is the final, final thing that ensures recovery. And it's called preservation. We need to preserve the spiritual gains and the gains in growth in character as they occur. But a lot of times we don't preserve them. We can persevere through the worst times, but after it's over, we haven't preserved our gains. As I video this right now, you know, there are folks coming out of the COVID ep epidemic and they're not doing too well. Because a couple of years ago, some of us thought we might die from something that another country developed. And it's been so stress stressful and hurtful and harmful and you're drained. Well, don't let that drain continue. Get the support you need. You may need to up the elements of your recovery program. I thank you for watching this program. I hope and pray that my dream that we have brought recovery right back to the Bible where it started, life recovery, that that's going to make a difference in your life and in, in the lives of people you love. I'll see you next time on Life Recovery Today. Thanks for joining us for Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. We hope this program has helped you integrate God's truth and wisdom into your recovery journey. This program is brought to you by New Life Ministries, and it's your support that keeps this program on the air. When you contact us for any reason, be sure to let us know that you watch on NRB. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE or go to liferecoverytoday.net. Please join us again next week for more Life Recovery Today.